um, for joining us. We're really excited to have um, three fantastic speakers today, Andy, David, and Nick. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, hopefully we figure out our audio and we can get Natalie on the line here. Um, Natalie's joining in from New York. I'm here in Massachusetts. And like so many of you, I'm sure you're joining from lots of different parts of the country in um, your homes or wherever you are. So thank you so much. Um, so this is this uh, webinar is being recorded, and um, you can submit questions at any time during the webinar in the control and chat box. Um, so please submit them at any time for our for our panelists, and we will uh, address as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Um, please join in in the conversation online. Um, we are. We are always looking to uh, connect through social media, so please feel, please uh, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, and you know shout out to any of our our amazing speakers today too through um, social media. So please join in the online conversation as well. So this webinar is being brought to you by the Green Chemistry Commitment, which is a program here at Beyond Benign, a consortium program that aims to unite the green chemistry community around these shared goals to expand the community of green chemists, um, grow departmental resources, and share best practices, um, and ultimately affect, affect systemic and lasting change in chemistry education. There's more information that you can find on our website, and we're really thrilled to have three green chemistry commitment signers today as part of today's webinar. As part of our webinars, we always uh, give out some green chemistry swag as well, so we'll be randomly selecting participants um, at the end of the webinar, and we'll announce those. Um, we have this lovely green chemistry t-shirt and a couple books on hand, too. So with that, I am going to um, first introduce Andy Dix. Um, Andy is a professor at the University of Toronto. Um, and he's been uh, a leading voice in green chemistry education for a number of years and a leading expert in implementing green chemistry, particularly in the organic lab courses. Um, and so I'm going to hand the controls over to you, Andy, to get us started, and then we'll come back and introduce um, David and, and Nick as well. So I'm going to transform, uh, hand the, so you should see a prompt, Andy. Okay. Okay. And All right. Don't see the slides. Yeah. Oh, are we presenting from these slides or your slides? Sorry. Your slides. Oh, that's why. Yes. So, sorry. <laughs> so, let me come back to me and now I'm going to have it so that you can Okay, that looks good. Okay, you should be able to. Great. You should be able Great. to go forward. Okay, thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Amy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of myself and David and Nick, we hope that you're all well. We hope that you're all safe. And, and we, we really do appreciate you uh, participating in this today. <clears throat> So I'm going to speak a little bit about what we've been doing at, at the University of Toronto for about 20 years or so in terms of green chemistry. Uh, just to give you a bit of perspective uh, on our department, we have about 2,000 students taking first year chemistry. As you can imagine, most of them are not bound for a chemistry program. Most of them are life science students. We graduate about 150 students a year in about eight different chemistry programs. And we have about 40 uh, faculty in total uh, at my campus of, at U of T. Uh, and, and that's a combination of research faculty and teaching faculty. So we're a very big department and we have thought a little bit about the we best way to implement green chemistry and to teach it uh, over, over uh, quite a while now. Okay, so I, whoops, I went one slide too far. Let's see if I can go back. Okay, I think you'll see this slide a couple of times this afternoon. These are the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And these have provided us with quite a nice framework in the last few years to talk about green chemistry and sustainability, because if you look at them, 
may be familiar with them, green chemistry does factor in quite well into quite a number of these goals. Uh, number seven, affordable and clean energy would be a nice example. Uh, another one would be clean water and sanitation, number six. And uh, even you can think about it factoring into gender equality, number five, if you if you think uh, quite carefully about that. So these are these these are a very nice nice framework for us. And generally, what 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 I've been thinking of for a while, and my colleagues at U of T, is that modern university chemistry education requires cu curricula, really demands curricula that specifically address societal and environmental challenges that students face, and to, to that face at the moment and, and will face in the future. And what I more specifically mean in that regard, that the following is really required, that we as educators integrate sustainability principles into different courses that we teach, uh, programs that students are going to take at our institutions, uh, research practices for undergraduates and leading on into graduate school, and other activities as well within our department. So that, that's my, my first thought here. Second one is that we need to introduce principles around green chemistry and sustainability early. Uh, and as uh, university educators, that means first year and to scientists, not just to chemists. So in instead of waiting perhaps until we have a captive audience of chemistry students talking about these ideas uh, very early on in our first year courses. And thirdly, green chemistry is a great venue for problem solving and decision making and we should try and embed as much of that into our undergraduate courses as we possibly can just to give you a sense of our departmental timeline here so we really started thinking about green chemistry in the early 2000s in the venue of, of shifting our very large scale labs to micro scale labs so we so we had a shift to micro scale chemistry primarily in our organic courses around about 2000 2001 something like that if you fast forward a few years a colleague and i worked on a couple of courses together in in second year introduction of green chemistry experiments into the life science organic curriculum and also into a third year uh, green chemistry techniques course that I'll say a little bit more about today. In 2012, we established in our department what's called our Green Chemistry Initiative, which is run by graduate students, and they are really a force of nature that, that allow us to develop, develop new curricular materials, for example. And we really moved into first year courses about five years ago into first year general chemistry and organic chemistry because we, we teach a semester of organic in, in our department. We actually joined the, the green chemistry commitment in 2016, which, which sounds like not that long ago, but really we were being empowered by the, by the commitment for, for several years before that and, and signing on to it really became a bit more of a formality for us. So in the uh, venue of, of systems thinking and, and the 12 principles of green chemistry, uh, when we started teaching about 20 years ago, we really took these principles one by one and took a very reductionist approach to, to educating students about them. So students might do a reaction in the laboratory where uh, they substituted a solvent that was that was more hazardous for one that was less hazardous and, and had to think a bit about why they did that. Really these days I think the more uh, modern approach is to look at the 12 principles as being a system where, where they the, the, the separate 12 uh, ideas here are really interlinked with one another and from a first year uh, life science student perspective really if we look at the 12 principles uh, they are all, in terms of a big picture approach, nearly all of them thinking about elimination of hazards or elimination of waste. So they, they kind of reinforce one another in those two big ideas. And when we teach first year students, then most of which won't go on into chemistry, we're trying to reinforce these ideas all the time. The big picture ideas in that we would like to eliminate or at least reduce hazards in a chemical process and eliminate or idea reduce or ideally eliminate waste in such a process as well. How have we done this then in large courses? Well, in our first year organic course, 
which has about 1800 life science students enrolled in it, we traditionally had five lab experiments and we've actually maintained those experiments in terms of the practical approaches largely uh, and not designed any new brand new green chemistry experiments. What we have done differently for a number of years is to get students to think about the experiments themselves really through a green lens. And here we've adopted the approach of Tom Goodwin, who published this in, in 2004, and that is to look at a, a, a chemical process and think, get students to think about it. Well, what was green about it? What was not so green and what could be made greener? And this is a, 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 a nice approach in that it doesn't require uh, an institution who, who may be limited with resources and finances and so, so on, doesn't require an institution to develop a new lab curriculum. It's very possible to, to take any experiment and, and really to think about it in this particular way. Uh, what we have done more specifically with a couple of organic uh, wet chemistry experiments is to get students thinking about, for example, properties of solvents. So a, a, a typical initial experiment that many schools would run would be uh, having students in organic chemistry looking at the solubility of different solutes in different solvents. And we've used this as an opportunity to get the students to reflect on the properties of the, of the solvents that they are handling in terms of an industrial solvent selection guide. And they're using SDS and, and hazard symbols for the solutes as well and thinking about all of this really with a with a green chemistry perspective and focusing in on the the fifth of the 12 principles later on in the semester they perform another technique experiment where it is it is extraction based and the separation of a solid mixture by uh, that technique and there they they revisit uh, the fifth principle but they also uh, think largely about the seventh principle as well in terms of using renewable feedstocks and thinking about the compounds that they are separating, where do they actually come from, uh, rather than just taking them out of the bottle and using them. So those are a couple of examples and there's a reference at the bottom of the slide that goes into more detail if you're interested. In first year general chemistry, uh, we have about the same enrollment every year. And the first experiment there recently is, is having students do a very, very simple reaction where they quantify hydrogen gas that's made by reacting magnesium metal with hydrochloric acid. In that experiment, students are uh, made to think about the reaction beyond the actual chemical yield. So they think about ad the atom economy of the process, the reaction mass efficiency, and, and start to think of the reaction as a system and, and not just in terms of uh, getting the product and measuring what the yield is. In our third year curriculum, we developed about uh, 11 or 12 years ago, a course called Organic Synthesis Techniques. This has a, a central pillar of, of uh, catalysis. The experiments are built around catalysis as one of the 12 principles. As, as you can imagine, a mix of chemistry program students in this particular course. Uh, students do reactions under solvent-free conditions. They do solvent replacement. Uh, the, the classes around this course educate them, about a, a quarter of the classes educate them on advanced green chemistry principles. And what we have tried to do in more recent times is, is to give students a sense of laboratory autonomy. So some of the experiments that students do are essentially student designed experiments, again, through a green chemistry lens. And two or three of them are highlighted on this slide. The one that uh, really captures students imagination is, is experiment seven, where they have to design their own multi-step synthesis over a two week period, about nine hours of practical work and they're challenged to design a, a, the synthesis of a compound in, in three or four steps and to make it as green as they possibly can. So taking into account all the principles that they've been taught throughout the semester and previously. So the approach to that, we, we, we published uh, uh, five or six years ago, if, you, if, you, if you're interested in that. So this really leads me to present what our departmental system of green chemistry education looks like. And a lot of what we do, as I mentioned earlier, is feeding out of the green chemistry commitment. 
So really the principles of the commitment are feeding into our laboratory experiments that we design, undergraduate courses, we, we have green chemistry and sustainability in, embedded in about seven of them. This feeds into undergraduate programs, uh, a couple of which have, have a, a big green chemistry emphasis that feeds into graduate research. And I do want to highlight for the last two or three minutes that, that I, I've got uh, the Green Chemistry Initiative, which, uh, as I mentioned, is this student, graduate student run organization uh, and what they've really done and the impact that they've had in our department. So the Green Chemistry Initiative or, or GCI uh, started eight years ago. It, it was a it was a self-directed exercise and a number of graduate students just said we want to start this and to me would I be their faculty advisor and typically the group is about 20 in size. This is the the the, the group from a few years ago. Uh, there's an executive amongst the 20 and the mission or the goals of the, the GCI are really threefold. Uh, firstly, to help produce educational materials for, for students, for, for graduate students and for undergraduates primarily, uh, to promote sustainable lab practices within the chemistry department, but also beyond the chemistry department and just generally to raise departmental awareness about green chemistry. And the sorts of things that they have done are uh, to spearhead uh, department sustainability campaigns, things like solvent recycling. We now have an acetone recycler in our uh, chemical stores because of their efforts. Uh, a shut the sash campaign in terms of uh, reducing the, the level of uh, fumed sashes. They organize annual symposia for our own uh, graduate students and for students coming from other institutions. And they also have run a very, very successful YouTube campaign that highlights the 12 principles in a, in a less formalized chemical manner, but in a, a more accessible manner for uh, the general public. And, 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 and that has been uh, uh, widely viewed. So <clears throat> there is a, a nice open access article that, that, that uh, the GCI wrote uh, in Green Chemistry Letters and Reviews that was published last year for more information. So just a few final thoughts to, to wrap up uh, my portion of this. Firstly, I uh, want to re-emphasize that uh, in doing curriculum renewal, we don't really need to reinvent the wheel and that we don't need to design lots and lots of new experiments, although there are a lot out there uh, that have been published that you could easily adopt if you wish to do that, but you could certainly just have students looking at existing experiments through a green chemistry lens. That's a very uh, straightforward thing to do. Uh, my experience is that undergraduates and graduate students are really, really interested in uh, this form of curriculum development and that they're very enthusiastic about uh, working on green chemistry projects and initiatives, as are the students that are being taught about the principles. They, they see the point of it, for, for want of a better phrase. Uh, Integration for us across the curriculum has been key. Uh, rather than just designing a green chemistry course, we've tried to embed it across lots of different courses in different subdisciplines, and we feel that that is very important. The GCC has been has been absolutely critical in in terms of informing us about all sorts of different uh, aspects in that regard. Uh, and, and finally, and, and, and very very um, nicely from from our perspective we've seen this flow into faculty research activities. So now faculty are identifying themselves as doing green chemistry. They're talking about that at conferences. They're advocating that amongst uh, their students. And, and, and that's very refreshing and the sort of thing that we really wanted to see when we started this quite a while ago. So uh, that's it from me. Happy to answer questions uh, a little bit later on. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, I am now going to hand the controls over to David LaVisca. Dr. David LaVisca is an assistant professor at Seton Hall University. He's a green chemistry advocate and brought his department to the green chemistry commitment in 2019. His passion and the department environment have allowed for many changes in a short period of time. It, it really is remarkable. So um, I'm happy to hand it over to you, David. Great, thank you, Amy. Um, first of all, uh, 
I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, I and feel a great privilege in not only being invited by Beyond Benign to do this, but also to be appearing on the same program with Andy and Nick. So um, a couple of words before I get started. First of all, my slides are reasonably tech heavy, which I think we all know is not that appealing, but I know it's being recorded and you can return to it if you want to. So I wanted to try and get quite a bit of information in there. Um, Second of all, uh, I don't know how much time we will have for questions, but I'm easily findable uh, both through Beyond Benign as well as the Seton Hall Chemistry website. And I'm on Twitter also. So I love talking about these uh, concepts and would be more than happy to meet you and speak with you about it. So uh, on my title slide, you can see that we are a green chem commitment signer. We just signed uh, last year actually. And um, that was great because we only started thinking about green chemistry the year before. So we're very new to this. And um, I only put my uh, own name on the title slide, but as you'll see, as I go through these slides, uh, you can't um, have, do a lot in a short time without a lot of really fantastic people being involved. So I'll call them out as we go. So I wanna tell you a little bit about Seton Hall, uh, just so that you know uh, who we are. We are an R2 institution. We're located in North Central New Jersey. Um, we have, we're about medium size. We have about 10,000 students, about 60% of which are undergrads. Uh, in terms of our department, we have 16 full-time faculty, 11 of which are tenure or tenure track and five non. And 14 of those 16 are research active. So it's uh, a very productive department. Um, and we graduate about 35 chem majors a year, and that includes biochemistry. Um, we have both ACS and non-ACS tracks. This is important. I feel like I need to get in the part about the chemistry department because um, really the vast majority of students we see uh, daily are not chemistry majors. We have a gigantic biology slash uh, health sciences cohort of students, which is probably the case for many of you at different institutions, and they go through our gateway courses as well. Uh, I like it that Andy pointed out that um, they're making an effort to discuss these principles with students beyond just chemistry, and that's actually a lot of the reason we got into this, so I'll give you a little bit of that background. Going back to uh, two decades ago, or roughly 2000 to 2010, growth in our campus was fairly consistent, um, going upward. And then you can see in the time since that there have been uh, a couple of things that contributed to what has become very rapid growth. We're having massive expansion in the sciences, particularly in the health sciences. But um, I won't go into, you can see for yourself on the slide, the things that have uh, contributed to that. But in general, there's a very great interest in the sciences, in the STEM majors at Seton Hall. And one of the things that got us thinking about how we wanna teach and how we wanna incorporate um, perhaps um, a more broad thinking, sustainability-based curriculum is the fact that we have uh, student numbers growing so rapidly. So why green chemistry then, right? And I think that every department needs to consider this. Um, you can see from all three of our presentations today, I'm sure that there are a lot of different things that you can do in this area. Um, before I started really contributing thought to this, I think I felt like I didn't know where to begin. I felt like there was maybe too many things. It seemed like a lot of work. It seemed like a very steep, uh, activation barrier, uh, very high activation barrier. So um, I think anyone considering this, and I think you all should be considering this, uh, needs to think about why it would apply to you specifically. How is it personalized, not only to you, but to your students and to your institution? So just very quickly for um, we at Seton Hall, it is in very good alignment with the university mission. I do have the mission statement. I think it was on the previous slide. I sort of blew past that, but it's uh, very um, highly focused at Seton Hall in all departments on sustainability and stewardship. Stewardship is a really big thing, and this obviously fits very nicely with the tenets of green chemistry. Uh, in terms of local industry, we have a lot of students who go into local industry. Uh, we have an extremely international student body, but there is a large uh, percentage of students who are 
Northeast localized. And um, I think most of us that have read anything about green chemistry know that the green chem principles are in really close alignment with what most industries um, value if they do chemical transformations. Catalysis is one of the tenets of green chemistry, and we have a long-standing of applied catalysis at uh, Seton Hall, which is now actually closing down. Uh, it's being evolved into a new center for green chemistry and catalysis. But because we have this 50 plus year legacy of doing work in uh, catalysis, that was also very nice sort of um, uh, segue, I guess, from catalysis focus to green chemistry more broadly. Um, we've also been looking at broadening and diversifying our curricula. One of our goals is to hand, enhance the inclusiveness of our classes. Our student body is quite diverse and becoming more diverse every year. And so we're trying very hard to appeal not only within chemistry, but well beyond. Um, number five, which is very important as well, we do have a very large uh, cohort of health sciences majors and they don't all flourish. Um, and we thought that it would be important to give them a broader view of what they're learning, uh, and perhaps even give them insight into careers beyond the health sciences should they need to start thinking about an alternative path. Finally, and most importantly, and I even made the word green on my slide, is context. So students tend to learn, particularly in the gateway courses, Gen Chem especially, but also organic, they tend to learn concepts in a vacuum very hard for them because there's so much material and um, so much built up reputation to these classes. I think it's hard for students to come in with an open, inquisitive, curious attitude. Um, and they tend to learn individualized topics sort of in a vacuum rather than thinking about the fact that they really apply to the world around them. So green chemistry is an excellent way of integrating things like system thinking, life cycle analysis, again, stewardship of the planet, all of these things that we are now trying to discuss in our classrooms on a regular basis. So as I said, this is not one person, far from it. Uh, you can see our building in the bottom picture. Uh, in 2018, in the summer, uh, June of 2018, so it seems like 20 years ago, and it's not even two years ago, we got together and started discussing this. And by we, I mean the two directors of what is now the former Center for Applied Catalysis, uh, Bob Augustine and Cedric Chamelian, and then myself and Cecilia Marzabati and Rory Murphy. Uh, I won't explain how this group came together, but I put the slide in not only so you can see their faces, but so you can see that we come from different backgrounds. Um, and I think this is really good. I think that this is important. I don't think that any one particular specialty is better disposed to green chemistry than any other. We do read a lot about organic experiments and that's what I call the low hanging fruit in terms of changing things up because we can get rid of nasty solvents and so forth. But all areas of chemistry can be thought of through a green lens. And so this was the core of our green chem committee. In the meantime, other people, uh, Dr. Nada Khan, Dr. Jose Lopez, who's actually a physicist, um, Dr. Uh, Kaz Antonacci, who is uh, our lab coordinator. These people have come on board also. And so it's much further reaching than even just this core committee, for which I'm very grateful. Um, but we did start as this group. And uh, as I said, remarkably, it's only been a little over 18 months ago. It seems like a lot's happened uh, in that time. So very quickly, I don't wanna belabor this part of it, but I do wanna show you what's possible. Um, and this is just a small subset of what we've been working on. Fortunately, my colleagues are extremely energetic, but I think more, more than that, it's the fact that we can see how this is impacting the students and the contextualization of the information we're teaching is very obvious in a very quick way. So myself, of course, but my colleagues also, we become energized by what we see happening uh, in the classrooms and laboratories. So pedagogically, uh, we decided sort of on an overnight basis to completely overhaul our organic chem lab curriculum, and that's for the non-majors. So we have about 200 students um, go through that course each year, uh, maybe a little more than that. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, we've done a bunch of 
assessments preliminarily. Dr. Nada Khan, who's been working on the organic portion of this, has done incredible work and will hopefully be publishing some of that soon. Um, we have new equipment. We are redesigning the Gen Lab uh, and, and lecture curriculum. So we've, we've done a lot of things pedagogically. That's really where we started. Um, we are in the process of forming. We, we've submitted paperwork, and this is a long process. As I said previously, we're forming the Center for Green Chemistry and Catalysis, and that really is a, a research initiative as well as a teaching initiative. And I'll speak to that a little bit more, uh, but not too much that's in process now. And then outreach, we've done some outreach, and unfortunately, a couple of our outreach things for this coming summer have been scuttled now because of the coronavirus situation. So we're in the process of regrouping a bit, but we have been working hard to spread the word and really make contacts and network. So again, as I said at the beginning, if you're interested in networking and talking and making new friends and you know contacting us, please do not hesitate. So to give you an idea, this is our organic curriculum. This is new. Um, it's a very challenging thing. I think to uh, even change one lab, never mind an entire curriculum. And I, I want to again speak to what something Andy said, which I think is critical, and that is you don't have to put a new lab in. You can take an existing lab and look at it through a green lens, try and get students to think about where they're using a lot of solvent, where they're refluxing for two hours. Um, there are a lot of different ways of looking at this. We decided to just jump into the deep end. We totally overhauled our entire uh, two semester organic lab course for the non-majors. And so all of the experiments are now green. This is particularly tricky as you can see in the first semester because that's mainly skill building. I think we all know that, those of us who teach organic chemistry. Um, so that's been a challenge and it's not entirely perfect. A couple of the experiments we're using are totally brand new, but most of them are taken from the literature. The second semester is mainly focused on synthesis, and we have a lot of very established methodologies that highly talented people have developed over the years and published. And this is a, really becoming a living curriculum. Um, what we're doing now, we're in the process of it now, uh, will probably be different next year and probably different the year after, but we have started the process. And we did so by not doing one new lab, but really by overhauling the entire 21 lab sequence. This experiment in the upper right, the uh, two-step ferroin to ferrill transformation, I'm going to call out a little bit more in the next slide. You can see here, again, harking back a bit to what Andy said, we did change some of the components of this lab. It used to be the traditional benzoin uh, condensation, which is really benzoin coupling, but we changed the starting material, but we're trying to get the students to compare what we call orange or what it used to be uh, with what it is now. Um, and these sorts of comparisons really enlighten students to um, not only why what they're doing is greener, but it causes them to think much more broadly about the concepts they're learning and how they actually complete these transformations rather than, than them just being structures on a page. Here's an example of an assessment. We have Students think about various conditions and ask them what they think is most green. And usually we give them things. If you look at this later on, you can see that experiment two is obviously the most green. But what's the second most? Experiments one and three have conflicting data. And this is important because real life has conflicting data. So we really are trying to probe students to think um, about these uh, principles. For general chemistry, again, Andy pointed out the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I teach general chemistry to non-majors. I have 150 students in my class, and there are three sections of that size. And um, I have used this to contextualize the things that they're learning, and I'm really not going to go into that. And it's all very preliminary. I just started it this year. Um, and again, it's now been uh, interestingly um, changed by the current remote learning circumstances. But it's a wonderful um, conversation starter. I think that's a good way of putting it. We've had a lot of very lively discussions in the classroom and beyond. Lastly, I would like to point out that this is not really just about teaching. This is about research as well. And for those of you who are wondering about this part of it, um, I would encourage you to think about how you can leverage 
both a departmental change as well as uh, a way that you approach your own research. So I'm an organometallic chemist. Starting my research initiative at Seton Hall, I've only been there, this is my third year. Um, it happened to coincide nicely with the start of the Green Chem Initiative. And as it turns out, developing labs that are green or greener and looking at lab development in general is a fantastic teaching and training tool for undergraduates. Um, all of my student researchers are undergraduates and I started them by looking at established protocols and asking them to think about how they would be improved. And in fact, my undergraduate researchers piloted all of the lab sequences we are now using in the Orgo uh, coursework. So they did that and the skills they learned doing that allowed them to then move into actual the organometallic chemistry that I'm interested in from a scholarly standpoint. And of course, we're doing it as greenly as we possibly can, which is quite convenient because they all have these skills already learned. So this is not just a classroom thing. This is also a research laboratory way of thinking. So finally, in summary, I just want to tell you, uh, if you're thinking about this, but don't really have green in your department, there's no single best approach. I don't think there's any right answer here. I think any answer is a good answer if you're going in the right direction. Flexibility is really important. Collaboration is extremely helpful. Take advantage of resources that are out there. And then I won't go through this, but I put you a, I gave you here a very brief action plan um, that starts with think about the question, why green chemistry, and then gives you some directives. We just dove right in. And um, I think we we're all a little worried in the beginning, but it's amazing how when you see the impact it's having on students in terms of their thinking and the depth of their learning, it inspires you to keep going and you really think of more and more ideas and challenges, not only for yourself, but hopefully you have partners that will help you with this in your own department. So I will stop here and hand it back to Amy or Natalie, and I will be happy to entertain questions either later or offline at any point in the future. Wonderful, thank you so much, David. That was fantastic. Um, I'm gonna hand the controls over here to Nick as I introduce you. Um, so Dr. Nick Kingsley is an associate professor at the University of Michigan Flint. He's a green chemistry and systems thinking champion bringing the United Nations sustainable development goals across the chemistry curriculum to help address global challenges. And um, I'm gonna hand it over to Nick, but I should also mention that these slides will be posted along with the uh, recording on the link that you'll get in the email that you registered through. So um, if you're jotting things down, you know, as, as um, these faculty are going through these slides, you'll, you'll see a, another copy as well. So with that, um, take it away, Nick. Thanks so much. Thank you, Amy. Um, I, first, I would like to say that I'd like to share the same sentiments that Andy and David had about the opportunity to meet or to get with all of you and discuss green chemistry, especially with everything that seems to be going on globally right now. This is kind of a refreshing sense of normalcy in a time of a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into great detail about who we are. Um, we're primarily undergraduate institution and that information about us is there on that slide. Um, I want to kind of intro with that our, our department took a very different approach to green chemistry than what you've seen from our previous two presenters. Um, and we, we got started in the green chemistry world in 2013 when Amy and Beyond and I made their original call for green chemistry commitment signers. A lot of department logistics and university logistics really put that on the back burner for a while. Uh, and in fall of 2016, um, I had the opportunity to go to Amy's toxicology what workshop at the BCCE out in Denver and uh, out in Colorado and really is when our big green chemistry push in our department started to occur. And that coincided with us signing as a green chemistry commitment signer in 2017. And for us, uh, we did not take the curricular approach at first. We, where do I, I'm, there we go. We actually took, um, the approach of starting a uh, bachelor's degree in green chemistry before we did widespread implementation across the curriculum. And, you know, David's last comment on his slide about there's no single best approach. Um, for us, this was actually a pathway of least resistance compared to implementation across the curriculum in the department. And so really the green chemistry degree looks very similar to what you would expect for a standard Green or standard chemistry degree program. We had two semesters of general chemistry, organic, physical, analytical, and lab, 
a semester of inorganic chemistry lecture and lab. We have two semesters of seminar. We, for the green chemistry program, do require two semesters of research as opposed to one. And instead of taking a one semester biochemistry survey course, we have our students take the full year 400 level biochemistry lecture. Where the differences lie is over on the right hand side here is that we took existing expertise around our campus to try to build curriculum that was centered around the 12 principles of green chemistry. So really, we had been in talks of rolling out a green chemistry course for our department for a long time. We have a course that used to be taught in our department called environmental toxicology, which has now really morphed into more of a molecular toxicology course. Our engineering department teaches courses on life cycle assessment and industrial ecology and then sustainable designs of products and systems. Our public administration unit teaches a graduate course on environmental law and public policy. And so we had a series of different pieces in place around campus. And we decided that our first step was really to create this degree program because of we, what we viewed as its importance. And then have been working since in trying to implement green chemistry throughout the curriculum, which you'll see in a minute. The outcome of this is our department has started to create mission statements for each of our different degrees. And, and the mission for the green chemistry program is listed here. And I won't read it. It, the words are there, but the, the thing that I think that speaks to the power of green chemistry and the impact that it can make is when you create a mission statement like this for something and you have people from your university and the admissions office and the recruiting office say, if this is the mission for your green chemistry degree, how can we go about trying to effectively recruit students to do degrees in other areas of chemistry? And I think that really speaks to the power and the impactfulness that green chemistry can have that people see that designing safer chemicals, designing sustainable processes, that chemists are thinking about the environmental, social, and economic impacts. It, it really is opening up some eyes across our university in terms of what kind of impact something like this could have for the broader community. Now, I'm not gonna lie, we, we seemed at face value to have an easy time getting this program off the ground, but there certainly has been some programmatic issues centered around this that I think is an important piece to tell because even when things are going well, um, maybe there's still roadblocks people are gonna find. Um, for us, one is what happens when you develop a degree program that relies on a lot of other courses that aren't in your department's control. So how do we have time slots available for students to take all the classes they need? How do we make sure that course offerings are being taught in a consistent manner for our students to graduate? How do we control when different prerequisites are changed? How do we, the, the students in this degree program have very limited course flexibility. Their, their schedules are really, really limited in the sequencing of courses. And what happens when you have to do substitutions for your degree for things that are outside of your departmental control? And so these are all things that we have been working through as a department um, after we developed the new, after we've developed the program. At a university level, um, things that people might want to think about is, you know, sometimes that not everybody has an understanding of what green chemistry is and so making sure that the narrative of your program is being shared effectively to everybody uh expertise expectations um we we have received a lot of requests from people for us to be involved in things that maybe are outside of our area of expertise because they feel like green chemists then must know everything about all there is to do with sustainability across all science disciplines um and enrollment expectations whenever you develop or spin off something that is new and exciting um how do, you, how do you help get the university or your college to understand, you know, what might be realistic enrollment expectations for students who are going to be looking to enroll in a degree like this, especially for a department that's smaller in size like ours is. Now, along with this, one thing I do wanna point out is that there's a lot of ways for people who are struggling to get green chemistry initiatives off the ground on their campuses that they can do that I think might be a way for them to help gather support. And these are things that we've learned, we thought about up front and have learned as we've gone through this process. One is that it, it, it surprised us at how much awareness there was for the green chemistry commitment across our campus when we signed on. Um, the number of colleagues, even outside of the science disciplines who were in generally aware of what the commitment was. Um, from a social and environmental justice standpoint, um, there's a lot of faculty who are, have been looking to find homes for ideas and they view green chemistry as a place that maybe, even though they're not a scientist, some of their ideas might have overlap. 
specifically with the social sciences, arts, humanities, they, they find that they might actually have shared interests with chemists. And so it's been spawning some really great opportunities for us to collaborate across disciplines on our campus. Civic engagement, um, green chemistry has an excellent opportunity with your student chapters or even in your courses to get out and do civic engagement in the community, to do community outreach. And those are really big, important factors for students. And so I think these are areas that people might be able to use and avenues that people might have to help garner support for green chemistry in their campus. Now, for us, after we developed the new program, we started rolling out green chemistry across the curriculum. Um, there isn't any mandated expectation in our department, but faculty have been using green chemistry principles incorporated topically across all of our classes. And generally, these lie around systems thinking approaches to the way that we cover topics, incorporating the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals into things that we cover in the class, and really also focusing on the environmental justice and social inequality that exists, especially in a campus like ours sitting, sitting in the heart of Flint, Michigan. So I want to spend a few minutes going through some of the stuff that we've been doing specifically across courses that might spawn some ideas with people in ways that they can do these things inside of their classroom. In general chemistry, we use the Flint water crisis, or when I'm teaching general chemistry, we use the Flint water crisis when we're talking specifically about KSP and molar solubility, talking about lead 2 phosphate and lead 2 chloride, differences in solubilities, how lead ended up inside of the water, discussing how the pH of your drinking water is important. We can use this also to talk about water purification. How do we do disinfecting treatment? How do we oxidize out the organics? And I think that all of these are important topics, as David said, that give the students those context to why it's important for them to learn these topics. And one that maybe the students hadn't really thought about is, what does the water crisis have to do with pollution control? Um, the amount of plastics that have come into the city of Flint over the last four or five years is a number that isn't really able to be handled by our recycling centers. And so even things outside of what we might think directly with water crisis and things we're learning in the classroom, it also gives us some definite green chemistry ties in with plastics that aren't directly related to just the water crisis themselves. In terms of energy, uh, we can we're looking for energy and CO2 emission solutions. So we have conversations about solar panels, the materials that are used, the lifespans of the panels, the disposals of panels. And, and these conversations only take a few minutes in the classroom to engage in a conversations with the students. But the students really get excited when they start having conversations, thinking about a system as a whole and how the context of what they're learning in the classroom and how it applies to the broader sense of what they're going to be doing in the broader community. They get a really invigorated sense of the stuff they're learning, which can help them stay really engaged in the classroom and what we're covering. We also, in relation to energy, do talk about wind turbines. Um, we talk about the neodymium and the dysprosium that are used to make these. We talk about where these metals are being mined and the conditions that are there, because a lot of people, there's a lot of wind farms near our area, and students don't understand or know that of all the some of the things that go into the making of these wind turbines that can be a problem. Um, and anecdotally, I'll say that sometimes even when you feel there isn't an avenue that maybe you can connect with the students, um, one thing that I have found that really gathered a lot of the students' attention on this was talking about bird deaths related to wind turbines. So really thinking about all the different components that can go into systems and getting them to relate that back to the stuff we're covering in the classroom has been helpful to them. In the lab curriculum, uh, in general chemistry, we've incorporated sustainable polymers labs into both semesters. Uh, this was stuff that we had learned at the PUI Sustainable Polymer Workshop that was done in collaboration with Augsburg University and University of Minnesota. We also have used an iron determination using black tea as a chromophore, uh, and that reference for that is there. And we're still working through the logistics of that and doing that as an experiment. But these are ways that we've green some of the experiments that we're doing and also bring green chemistry topics into the classroom, into the laboratory. In organic chemistry, we're working on developing and working through some Suzuki Maura cross couplings and green solvents and looking at applications of solvent free deals all their reactions. In my inorganic chemistry lab that I teach, um, we have not worked at greening 
the actual experiments themselves, but we have, I developed a capstone project where the students have to pick an experiment they performed in their time at UM Flint, and it could be from any one of their chemistry labs that they took, and they need to go through and source the production of the chemicals they used in that reaction as far back as they can and give an eight minute presentation talking about how they define the boundaries of where they were looking for those chemicals were sourced from, the impacts that their experiments are having outside of going to the shelf to grab the chemicals and thinking more holistically about where these chemicals are coming from and what's going into those things. Some of them, depending on their background, whether they're taking the green chemistry course, actually will develop synthesis trees for the things that are there. And, and it's really beneficial for the students because I think the thing that they all took away is the biggest impact is that the biggest impact of the experiment they're doing is always far removed from the system they're directly experiencing. They, they take for granted that the chemicals we're using come from the shelf. And this gives them a real opportunity to think about the things they're using, where they're sourced from, and the cost and the energy and the resources that go into producing them. And last, I wanted to share, even though a lot of people on this webinar may offer green chemistry lectures, um, I have taken in the first teaching of our green chemistry lecture, um, developed a project centered around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so it was a three week project for the students. They had to write a six page research paper and do an infographic summary. And what they did was they picked a United Nations Sustainable Development Goal and they had to write what the goal was, which goal they picked and what it meant and then how green chemistry might be able to help them achieve this goal. And so these, the students developed these and presented their infographics to the class. And they had about, because it was an infographic, they had about five or six minutes to, uh, to do their presentation. And the students really, really got a great sense here of how green chemistry can help, call, help promote change in the world and also think about how chemistry may affect different parts of the world that they hadn't thought about before. And I couldn't, I would be remiss if I did have an opportunity to show one of those. So here's, here's just an example of one of the infographics that my student, uh, one of our students created. And, and I show it as a reason that I think this is a good example of the creativity and the inspiration that can come from students when, when they find passion for something. And I think that the students who worked on this project all had a renewed sense of what green chemistry meant to them and how it might influence the, the broader community. And so that is the end of my presentation. I didn't really have an outro slide, but I did wanna say thanks to everybody for being in on the webinar today, um, and David and Andy as well, who helped me be there with them, and that anybody can reach out at any time through Twitter, through email, um, more than willing to discuss any of the stuff I talked about that we're doing in the classroom that we're doing in the broader community. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nick. That was wonderful. Um, all three fantastic presentations here. Um, I think we have Natalie on the line as well. Um, so, <laughs> uh, Sorry for the technical difficulties there at the beginning of the presentation. Um, we are monitoring the chat box, so please, if you have any questions, um, if you haven't typed them in already, then please go ahead and do so at any time. Happy to have Natalie O'Neill, our higher ed program manager, on the line here with us as well, who's going to help us tackle some of these questions. We realize we're approaching the hour, um, and so we'll stay on to answer some of these questions. And if you do have to leave, please know that you will be sent a direct link to the um, to the recording for this so you can always access the question and answer period after as well. So with that, uh, Natalie, are you there on the line? <laughs> I believe I am here on the line this time. Yes, um, so we great do have to hear some your great voice. questions. <laughs> yes, great, it's great to be here with you guys. Um, so we do have some questions coming in. This one comes in for, from Glenn Hurst to Andy. It's a really interesting talk that you gave and Glenn is wondering, uh, to what extent is it feasible for products of some experiments being reactants of subsequent experience, experiments? It's rather demoralizing for students to have to go through the motions of synthesizing a product to meet learning objectives and then have to dispose of it. Any good examples of this, this increase in complexity pose an issue? Yeah, that's a good question, I think, from Glenn. Uh, thanks for that. I, th I think one thing that we can do and, and we certainly do this in a couple of our courses is, is focus a bit on multi-step syntheses rather 
rather than just one new reaction every week and the product gets thrown away as as, as glenn mentioned that is a little bit demoralizing so we do that in our 30-day course for example with a with a sunscreen synthesis so students are taking their material through uh three steps and uh, the product has a well-defined use it's a sunscreen so they're not just making something that's a white powder and tossing it away we are trying to invest investigate a little bit more collaboration with research faculty and uh asking them are there compounds that undergraduates can make as starting materials for graduate work uh, and and we've had a little bit of, of traction with that we've also tried to we try in the process trying to collaborate with a nearby chemical company to uh, make some compounds uh that they uh, actually want as starting materials and do a sort of um, reagent exchange where they give us some materials that our students work on to make a new material and then we give it back to the chemical company so i think there are things that can be done and we need to we need to broadly think a little bit more than make the get students to make compounds and and, and put them in a glass vial and then they just go go in the trash essentially yeah Great, thanks Andy for that answer. Um, we do have another question. This one comes to you, David. It says, do you think system thinking approaches to teaching can serve as a vehicle to connect departments from across your university, promoting interdisciplinary and collaborative learning and fulfilling your institutional mission? Perhaps not through green chemistry directly, but certainly sustainability. Um, do you think that that's something that you'll explore at Seton Hall in the future, or are you already? Uh, well, that's a really great question. So thank you to the to the asker of that question. I, yes, absolutely. So we have already thought about that. We have a number of preliminary things in place. Um, but uh, as our initiative, you know, moves on, I, I'm loath to continue um, highlighting how new it is, but it is new. So we have many, many things that we have envisioned that we haven't really gotten to yet because there are only so many hours in the day, of course. I think we all know that. But um, that is one of our goals. So one of the things I tried to highlight in my talk was um, there are things you can do yourself, and then there are things you can do with the help of other people. And I wrote down a couple of times that collaboration is really helpful. Um, you know, we have done what we've done because a lot of people in the close environment, that is the chem and biochem department, have worked hard um, to extend ourselves more broadly uh, requires, first of all, uh, support of the administration because you know, most of these things don't really happen for free because they are being added to our plate of things to do. Um, and we have to have a mechanism to actually work with coordinating with other departments. So um, my secret uh, Cheshire cat smile answer to you is that my goal is world domination, right? Um, I would like it to spread throughout the entire campus. And I think so would my colleagues. I think we will get there, um, and it will be through emphasizing sustainability and stewardship specifically. Um, I will tell you, and this will, I, all of the people who are longtime green chemistry folks can plug their ears for a moment. Um, we had a summer program scheduled for the summer that has been canceled, but we actually didn't put green chemistry anywhere in the marketing materials or in the title because we wanted to specifically draw people in because of the stewardship part and not scare them away with that scary word chemistry. So absolutely, I think that's a very important and possible thing to do. And I hope, you know, in my five-year vision, I, I hope that it looks a lot different then than it does now, but we're definitely working on that. And I think everyone could, right? I think it's a great way to pull a university campus together. Great answer, David. So I am just going to reveal the winner of our Green Chemistry giveaway. Um, Bob Fletcher, we will be following up with you in an email after. Um, congratulations on winning our Green Chemistry giveaway, giveaway prize today. Um, we do have a few more questions coming in, if we do have a little bit more time. Um, David, this one is specific for you about the certificate that you have at Seton Hall. So what level of education is Seton Hall targeting for their certification in Green Chemistry? 
Well, um, we don't have a certificate. So I think on that slide, hopefully there's an asterisk that says in progress. So we are trying to get that established. Um, that is all of the things that you asked in that question are the things that we're discussing right now. So we're trying to figure out, you know, would it be only chem majors? And the answer to that's gonna be no, but that's the first thing that people think about. Um, what are the criteria gonna be? What is the administration uh, gonna sign off on? Uh, and so on and so forth. So that's that's a great example of something that takes a lot more than um, uh, just a couple of people it, when you involve the administration and then of course the faculty senate and on and on. on. So we it, we have discussed it. It is something that has not run into any significant roadblocks yet, but we have not gotten there. So that is in progress, and we actually see that as a stepping stone toward where Nick is at. In other words, we would ultimately like to focus a lot more broadly on green chem and sustainability and start with a certificate but um, you know there have been words spoken out loud about having an actual bachelor's degree in green chemistry established at Seton Hall so how far down the road that is I'm not sure um, but we we have to get to the certificate part first but we simply we just aren't there yet unfortunately great and would it be okay if they reached out to you if they are interested in maybe doing a certificate at their institution and just learning from what you're experiencing there now? Oh yeah, absolutely. I love talking about this stuff um, and I'm happy to, to uh, collaborate with anyone. So please feel free to reach out anytime. Great, thanks David. We've just got one more question and it's coming at you, Nick. Um, this one is about connecting um, with your engineering department. Have you ever considered linking with the engineering department as an opportunity to bring in process chemistry? They, our, our engineering, we have thought about that. Um, our engineering department is relatively small at the point. At this point, they only offer a mechanical engineering degree and an industrial operations engineering degree. And so those two classes that are taught, that we use are taught by a, uh, sustainable scientist there who has a PhD in mechanical engineering, but a background in sustainable science. And so we've talked about it at first. Um, we're the, they're very cursory conversations at this point. And I think the issue there is, is doing some of that type of work would revolve, need to include hiring new people. We really don't have anybody on our campus with that direct expertise. Um, and so, but it is certainly something that we have discussed. Great, thanks. So there was one question that came in and this was just about um, curriculum and resources. And so I did send them a link to our On the Beyond the Nine webpage. There is a whole database of green chemistry curriculum that is currently available. And actually right now to help the teachers that are virtually teaching online, we just curated a list of green chemistry virtual resources from us and our partners. Um, we would love to hear your feedback on this. If you have time, if you have resources that should be added to this list, please let us know. We see this as a growing list to add to the content that people could be using as they're doing their virtual lectures overall. So I will also put the link to that um, site into the chat box now. Okay, that's wonderful. Uh, wonderful, thank you so much. And um, yeah, as as, uh, as Natalie mentioned, we know so many uh, folks are dealing with um, not only health and anxiety concerns, but also shifting to online teaching. So we are um, in awe of all of our faculty partners who have been able to do this in um, such a short amount of time. So thank you for all that you do. Um, please reach out to us if you have anything to add to our, our growing list. Um, with that, a final thank you to Andy, David, and Nick. It was so wonderful to hear your voices and to have this time. Um, I think, you know, David mentioned it, to have a little bit of normal time to think about green chemistry and all the wonderful things that you've been able to do at your own home institution. So thank you for spending this time with us and sharing your work with the community. Um, they are really wonder wonderful presentations.
Um, and thank you all for tuning into this webinar. It's been wonderful to have you. Um, you will receive a link. The recordings and supporting documents will be posted on our webinar site, but you'll also receive a direct link tomorrow in your email inbox as well. Feel free to sign up for um, future notifications about upcoming webinars on our on our homepage on beyondbenign.org. Um, and thank you so much for tuning in, and we we look forward to next time. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.